In this series, we're trying to bring an old HP 150A all vacuum tube oscilloscope back to life. And in the previous episode, we, uh, we did just that. We brought it back to life, but it wasn't uh, exactly the best life that we could have gotten out of it. There was some pretty nasty problems that I'm gonna try and hope to fix today. Uh, most notably is that the uh, B channel on our dual channel uh, vertical amplifier just didn't really work. And uh, as a matter of fact, since I last filmed that episode, the B channel itself has actually gotten worse. Uh, it won't display anything now. Uh, but the A channel still seems pretty stable. So uh, the amplifier itself is getting there, but we need to work on the B channel a little more. And there's a couple other issues that I've come across that definitely need fixing. And so we'll hop over to the bench and go over those, fix what we can, and then hopefully we can get a little better life out of it. I'm not really sure where this is going to go yet. Uh, so hopefully it ends up with something awesome. Uh, but anyways, we're going to give it the old college try, so let's get over there and get started. Since the previous episode, I've done a little more testing on this machine. Uh, mostly I'm just trying to figure out what direction I need to run in. Uh, and while going over it, there were three things that I've come across that definitely need fixing before we go uh, any further in our troubleshooting problems. Uh, the first is, is that uh, in the previous episode, uh, we tested all of the vacuum tubes in the plug-in module here on the bottom, but we didn't test any of the vacuum tubes on the rest of the machine. And so I figured it would probably be good to go through and test them. And all of the tubes tested okay, except for this one. Uh, and so if we pop that in here, we'll turn the vacuum tube tester on here. And then if I pull the switch here to check the quality, well, we can see the needle is, man, just right on the very bitter edge of good, maybe into the question mark area. If we check the other triode in this uh, 60J8 dual triode here, uh, we see that the emission is essentially just as bad on it. So this vacuum tube tester may not give us a great idea of total emission for matching tubes, uh, but comparing tubes against each other let me know that this single tube was an outlier and probably should be replaced. And so that vacuum tube was V19. And so if we look at the schematic here, V19 is listed as a phase inverter. I'm not really sure what that means, but it's a part of the horizontal amplifier. And so I imagine that weak emission there would be causing some issue in the horizontal amplifier. The next issue was a fairly simple one. Uh, in the previous episode, we went through and replaced all of the black beauty capacitors with uh, new modern capacitors. And uh, I'd like to think that that made a pretty big difference in how it was operating, considering that those black beauty capacitors were in really rough shape. Uh, but I noticed that there was one black beauty capacitor that I missed in the low voltage power supply, which is over here on the end. And so I went ahead and snipped that capacitor out, and this is it right here. And you can see it's uh, split from top to bottom, and it's just in really terrible shape. And so if we look at the low voltage power supply schematic here, that capacitor was C154, which is a capacitor that comes pretty much directly off of the plus 130 volt DC rail. Um, and so if that capacitor was uh, being leaky or even if it was starting to short out at higher temperatures, that would pull our 130 volt rail down, which would cause some um, uh, pretty noticeable stability issues in other parts of the system because quite a lot of things are reliant on that 130 volt rail being good. And then to explain the last major issue, one of the times when I was testing it with the machine on its side, I noticed a spark when the time delay relay kicked off. And at first I thought this was just the contact sparking. But when I double checked it, I noticed that it wasn't coming from the relay itself. It was actually coming from above at this little component right here called RT303. And if we look at the schematic uh, for the low voltage power supply that we have here, RT303 is a 1000 ohm thermistor that is on the very high voltage rail here. So there's a lot of juice going through it, but I think our thermistor here is good and dead. So that's going to need to be addressed. Now on the schematic, it says that this thermistor may be omitted. And if we look at the bottom, it says this schematic is for serial number 1440 and above. So if we look at the serial number that's before that, uh, serial number 1390 through 1439, uh, we can see that in that same place, there is no thermistor there. As a matter of fact, it's just a straight wire across. So I think that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna desolder that thermistor, and then we're gonna solder in essentially just a straight shot across there, and uh, essentially just omit that part that the schematic said was okay to omit. All right, well, those basic changes seem to have made a massive difference. 
As a matter of fact, I think the uh, capacitor on the 130 volt rail made the biggest difference uh, because everything seems to be very, very stable now. Um, I've actually, I've had this on for about 30 minutes uh, so far and it's just rock solid stable. You can see that we have our HP 200 CD oscillator here putting out a sine wave and it's showing up beautifully here. And I've got our uh, very nice Siglent scope over here mirroring that sine wave. Uh, and so you can see that, well, the sine waves look absolutely identical. And even the B channel is starting to come back to life as well. There we go. It <laughs> It was, uh, I think, a little camera shy there because I had tested the V-channel about seven times before turning the camera on and every time it was solid. And then this time I plug it in and of course it spazzes out. <laughs> um, but as you can see, even the B-channel looks exactly the same as the A-channel. But there are bigger problems that we need to deal with. I'm going to go ahead and move this back over to the A-channel right quick. So this HP 200CD oscillator is one of the best oscillators that you can get. And I've got it tuned just about perfectly here. You can see it's putting out 1.002 kilohertz. Uh, and the peak to peak is six volts. So I've got channel A here set to 0 0.5 volts per centimeter. And each one of these blocks on the uh, grid here is a centimeter. I've got my, my little calipers here and you can see that comes out to uh, pretty much a centimeter exactly. So we can just count from here. So we've got uh, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5. <laughs> I, I can't come up with any combination of things in my brain that makes uh, 2.5 volts peak to peak displaying here match our 6 volts peak to peak displaying here. Now it should be noted that uh, the probes that I'm using uh, this one currently is set to times one, and this one is currently set to times 10. I believe that this one came with the AC21 probe, which only was available in times 10 or times 50. So we should have uh, 600 millivolts peak to peak or six volts peak to peak. And here I'm showing uh, two and a half volts peak to peak, uh, and it's set on times 10. So I have absolutely no idea what is going on here. <laughs> But it's not just our peak-to-peak uh, -peak this way. If we look at the frequency here, um, we're set to 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter. Um, so if we go from, let's adjust it here to center it just a little bit. So if we go here, that's uh, 0.5, 1, 1.5, 1 milliseconds. And if I open up my phone here, and I look up what 1.5 milliseconds is in frequency, that comes out to uh, 666 hertz. <laughs> the number of the devil. I, I'm going to need Sam and Dean for a little help here. <laughs> but yeah, 666 hertz is very clearly not one kilohertz. Uh, so we don't have the proper voltage showing on our peak to peak here, and we don't even have the proper frequency showing here. So our signal is making to it and it's displaying it rock steady. It's just way, way out of whack. All right, I've been spending hours trying to get this thing to where I want it to be. So vertical amplification happens in essentially two places. One is on this plug-in module on the bottom and that's what we're looking at right here. And then the other is there's a main amplifier on the chassis itself that connects directly up to the CRT deflection plates. And so the first step is making sure that the plug-in unit is doing what it's supposed to do. And it just so happens that in the manual for the plug-in unit, this is a HP 152B, there is a procedure for adjust amplifier gain. Uh, so it says we had to set both volts per centimeter uh, switches to 0 0.05 and both vernier controls to cal. Now the reason that we set it to 0 0.05 is if we skip ahead and look at this page right here, we can see that when it's set in 0 0.05, it essentially just bypasses all of the attenuating circuits that are in the switch. The next one is to uh, set vertical presentation to A only. And then we want to connect the 0.1 volt RMS 400 CPS sine wave signal source to input A. Uh, and that's where this big guy comes in, this little HP 200 CD. And you can see up here, I've got it putting out a uh, 100 millivolt peak to peak sine wave at 400 hertz. Well, we're at 393. 
Uh, but boom, there we go. I thought we were on the right track. Now, uh, people that are smarter than me will have noticed what I've done wrong already, uh, but I'll save the reveal for a little bit later. And then the uh, next step is to connect a model 400D voltmeter between pins three and eight of V510. And you can see I've got two leads hooked up to there. I don't have a model 400D vacuum tube voltmeter. Someday I might, I don't know. I'll have to see if one shows up for an affordable price at some point in time. I would love to get my hands on one. Uh, but my little uh, UNI-T uh, digital multimeter here is just, it's going to have to do it. Um, and then finally, we say adjust R524. This is on the front panel um, where it says cow to obtain a 400D indication of one volt RMS, which will indicate that channel A has a gain of 20 decibels. All right, so here we go. I've got uh, 100 millivolts up there, and I should see one volt RMS, but as you can see on the digital multimeter here, I'm seeing uh, 0.346 volts RMS. Um, and so I was ripping my hair out for two days trying to figure out what was going on with this. Um, I checked every single tube, I measured every single resistor, everything looked fine, and I was uh, asking and talking to people on the Discord, and Philip uh, is an absolute legend. He came out of nowhere with the perfect sanity check. He said to check the RMS on the input, and when I did, then it all clicked. So if we come back here to our uh, instructions here, it says, um, connect a 0.1 volt RMS 400 CPS sine wave. Uh, I saw this for whatever reason, and I immediately in my brain went, ah, uh, yeah, it's uh, 0.1 volts peak to peak, uh, which is what I have set up on the scope here. You can see uh, on our Siglent scope here, it's reading 100 millivolts. That's 0.1 volts from peak to peak. Well, peak to peak and RMS are not the same thing. I lost two days because of this. I should have just asked Philip from the get-go. <laughs> but he came in, he swooped in, and absolutely saved me. So he's an absolute legend. Um, so if you guys aren't on my Discord, hop over to the Discord and go thank Philip for me. So uh, 0.1 volts RMS is actually 0.28 volts peak to peak. So if we adjust our amplitude on our uh, 200 CD oscillator here, there we go, that's about uh, 280 millivolts. And if you look at this, now we can see that we have an RMS AC voltage of 1.004. So this is true of both channel A and channel B. I've got them both tuned to exactly one volt RMS. The plug-in amplifier module down here is working perfectly. But it hasn't completely solved our problem, so we'll take a look at the front of the scope right quick and see where our waveform is sitting. Uh, so I had to turn the lights off in the room so we could actually see the CRT here. Uh, and you can see that we have a 280 millivolt sine wave coming in here. Um, and that's 280 millivolts after the 10x reduction of our probe. Uh, but you can see that the, <laughs> well, the, the sine wave is straight off of the scale. Um, and so if we bring this up to 0.1 or 0.2, you can see the sine wave goes pretty much top to bottom. So if we count uh, the centimeters here, we've got 0.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, uh, 1.5, 2, 1.5, 2, and then 1.2. So we know that the 152B plug-in unit on the bottom is working correctly because, well, we verified that earlier. So the only other thing that could be possibly affecting the vertical amplification should be the main vertical amplifier. So that's where we're gonna shift our focus next. It's kind of at the back of the machine and it's split across two boards and uh, the, the bottoms of the boards actually face opposite each other with the tubes facing each other. Also, there's these two massive delay lines in here, which are very cool. But there's only seven tubes in here in total. And if we take a look at the schematic, it's actually a lot simpler than the plug-in unit on the bottom. So I went through and I measured as many of the resistors that I could easily get to. And then I went one step further and I started checking all of the voltages on the tubes according to this chart in the manual. And all of the voltages came out looking just right. So I was expecting something to be drastically out. And it, it just wasn't. And as a matter of fact, the only thing that I saw that uh, really kind of I felt needed to be addressed 
was one capacitor, and that's this capacitor right here on the schematic. This is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, and all it does is go to the grid of the 6AU8, which is the internal sync amplifier for the uh, horizontal section of the scope. Uh, and you can see that the 6AU8 is a pentode triode, and the pentode is used for amplification, and then the triode is used as a cathode follower buffer, and then the output of that uh, buffer goes to the sweep generator. So I went ahead and replaced the capacitor. It was just like a little wax type capacitor and these are pretty universally known to go bad. Uh, and then because I like to test things after replacing just a single component, I decided to fire it back up and well, that's, that's what we're looking at right here. And just like before, we have a 280 millivolt signal coming in. We have our volts per centimeter set to 0 0.2. And if we count the waveform, uh, well, well, before we count it, we can notice that it's actually a little unstable, which is interesting because it was really rock solid earlier. And all that I've changed is that capacitor, and it seems to have introduced a little bit of instability. But if we count how big the waveform is, we can see it's um, just about 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, just about 0.8 volts peak to peak. Now that's really interesting because it was at like 1.2 volts peak to peak before, and the only thing I changed was that little capacitor that went to the sink generator. And I would not have thought that the sync generator would have any effect on our vertical amplification. Uh, but if we take a look in the manual, uh, there's an interesting little paragraph that says the amplifiers in the instrument are direct coupled and balanced and corresponding voltages in each side of the circuit must remain balanced to keep the spot on the screen. The settings of gain, balance, and positioning controls can introduce unbalanced voltages and should be considered when checking an amplifier. So I think what happened is when we replaced that capacitor, it changed the balance between the vertical amplifier and the sync generator and ultimately the horizontal amplifier. And so what that means is that even though the vertical amplifier looked like everything checked out just fine, uh, we probably have a problem in either the horizontal amplifier or the sync generator causing an unbalance that results in far too much gain being shown on the vertical amplifier. And we know that there's something wrong in the sync generator circuit because our frequency isn't showing up right either. So on this massively long meandering path that we've been taking, uh, it looks like our vertical amplifier is mostly okay, and it's time to move on to the sync generator and the horizontal amplifier. Uh, but we'll save that for the next episode. We are making progress, albeit very slowly, but progress is progress, and I'll take any little wins I can get at this point. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching. We've got another part for this series coming up, so I hope you guys hang around for that one. But I've got a lot more troubleshooting to do, so I'm going to get right back into it, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.